So this is my firewall. And the keen-eyed among you may notice, I just took it out of my server rack. Well, that is because today we are upgrading to this. Let's go. Hey everyone, Mircha here. In this video, we are going to upgrade my firewall. But before we go into any of that, let's take a moment and talk a bit about what we have going on here. My current server is a DIY box running a quad-core i5-6500 that's heroically tamed by the mighty Intel stock cooler. It has 8 gigs of RAM in nothing but the scientifically proven most optimal single-stick configuration. For the OS, I'm running a pair of 256GB NVMe SSDs in a ZFS mirror. These are just some random Intel drives I got from a prefurb store down the street, so they're nothing really special. The case is an Intertech 2U20248. And what this essentially means is that it's a mid-depth 2U case. They also make a long-depth case, the 2U20255, which, as you guessed, is a bit longer and it has a bank of four hot-swappable 80mm fans down the middle, but since this system doesn't really need that much cooling capacity and I mainly wanted it to be quiet, I went for this option. Now speaking of quiet, I also added dual 80mm Noctua fans in the front of the case to pull cool air in and cool all of the components. This whole monstrosity of a system, if you will, is powered by a big white 300W TFX PSU. Initially, it was double-sided taped to the side of the case, but I eventually had to 3D print a bracket to be able to screw it in. As for the networking, I am using the onboard Intel NIC as my one port, and then I have a dual port add-in Intel card configured as a lag for my LAN network. All of my other networks are just VLANs off of that lag. I have another single port add-in NIC that's just an emergency network. It's essentially just a network with an allow all firewall rule. If I break something, I can easily plug into that and hopefully get to fixing it. This server actually has a bit of an interesting backstory. It's the server that has been in my home lab for the longest time. I first got it back in high school, I think I was in like 10th grade or so. My dad got me my first PC back then. It was an HP pre-built rocking this very same i5 we have right here. It has served me as my desktop for a while, then it moved on to be an ESXi host, RIP ESXi I guess, then it went on to be a Proxmox host, then it went on PFSense, and now finally on OpenSense. Now let's go back on topic. Let's take a look at what we are upgrading to. Inside this box, we have the Microtik RB5009 UG plus S plus IN, and what this long model number means is that it's just a low power and completely passively cooled router OS device from Microtik with quite an interesting assortment of ports. It's rocking 1, 2.5 and, and 10 gigabit network ports. Starting from the front side of the router, we have a DC power input, a 10 gigabit SFP plus port, a USB 3.0 type A port, a 2.5 gigabit RJ45 port which actually supports PoE input giving us the second means to power this device. And finally we have 7 more 1 gigabit Ethernet RJ45 ports. On the left side of the system we get a DC terminal power input which is the third and the final option on how to power this device. Other than that we have a pretty chunky heatsink that's also visible in the back of the device and nothing of interest really on the right side. Microtik also sells the K75, which is a rack mount kit that actually allows us to mount up to four of these devices in a single rack unit. Now, obviously, I don't need four routers in my home lab, but I ended up picking one up anyway, since I do want to rack mount this one. As far as the specs goes, this device is rocking a 64-bit quad-core ARM chip that's running at 1.4 GHz. For memory, we get 1GB and then we also get 1GB of NAND storage. So, overall, this should be a fairly capable routing platform. It may seem a little weird that I'm going from a DIY solution to a purpose-built one, especially since, spec for spec, the old server is technically more powerful. But, I have a few reasons. You see, I could go off on a bit of a tangent and say how I prefer the Microtik since it draws less power, it has 10 gigabit and 2.5 gigabit networking and so on and so forth. While all of those would be valid reasons, they're not actually what convinced me to make this upgrade. To be fully honest, there are three main reasons why I wanted to make this purchase and go on the Microtik train. First off, we have noise. My rack is currently in my bedroom, so the quieter and the cooler I can get it, the better. 
For example, I can't keep my NAS on 24-7 because it's simply too loud for me to sleep in the room next to it. But with this device being passively cooled, I doubt that would be a problem. Next up we have space. I want to reuse the case and the PSU for another project that's going to come later this year. Using up 2U of my half height rack just for a router is a bit wasteful and I'd like to make better use of the space that I have. And finally we have automation. This device simply has better automation support and network automation is something that I've really been looking into for a while but I was never able to achieve it quite to the extent that I was hoping to. Initially, when I was planning out this video and writing the script, I was thinking about how I was going to run performance tests on both of the systems and compare them. I wanted to showcase the difference both in terms of power consumption and the actual performance. But then I actually started working on this and I realized how silly of an idea that is. Let me explain. First of all, let's talk about performance. Again, my old router was a quad-core i5-6500 running at 3.3 GHz with 8 gigs of RAM. All of the network interfaces on that system are only 1 gigabit, and my use case for this router is mainly regular internet traffic and VPN. I don't really do any IDS or IPS or run any other services on that box except DNS and DHCP. So it's definitely able to saturate the link in such scenarios and I doubt anyone will argue otherwise. There isn't much benefit to running performance tests, in my opinion, as they will all be bottlenecked by my network and won't have any statistical relevance. The same discussion can be had for the new system. Again, the Microtik is a quad-core ARM chip running at 1.4 GHz with 1 GB of RAM. This system will definitely handle the 1 gigabit tests I would run on it, so the results will once again be bottlenecked by my network backbone being only 1 gigabit. Now, technically, this new router has a 2.5 gig and a 10 gig connection. I, however, have no other 10 gigabit devices to connect to it, so that test is just out of the question. I could run some tests for the 2.5 gig speed and see what I can get out of it, but here's the deal. Inside of my network, I am not really routing any storage traffic or anything that comes even close to saturating 1 gigabit. My NAS has a NIC in each network that needs access to storage, and generally speaking, most of the heavy lifting in this regard is done by the switch and not the router. The only other viable use case, I guess, in which I could exceed 1 gigabit is through downloading and uploading files. But even then, my actual internet is 300 symmetrical, so it doesn't even matter, I'm not even getting one qubit. So for all intents and purposes, I'm going to say that performance will be virtually identical between the two systems. None of them are bottlenecked by the actual capabilities of their internals, but rather by my network being limited to one gigabit at best. Now that performance is out of the way, let's talk about power consumption. I was initially planning to run some stress tests on both systems and then compare the power draw to showcase how much better the new Microtik is. Then I plugged in my old router to a kilowatt meter and I immediately noticed that it was drawing around 5 watts just by being plugged in. During the boot process, the power draw would spike up to around 50 watts or so and it would settle for a 30 to 35 watt idle power consumption. The new Microtik, on the other hand, has a 24 volt 1.5 amp power supply, so it cannot draw more than 36 watts, and it's usually idling around 8 or so. I don't think there's much point in running a stress test to measure power usage when the idle power draw of the old system is around the max possible power draw of the new one all while the new one has more and better network interfaces. Also note that for the power consumption figures I mentioned earlier, the Microtik had seven interfaces active and it was being used as my main router, while the OpenSense box was just idling around with nothing plugged into it at all. With that being said, I say we move over to the more interesting part of the conversation. The main reason I really wanted to do this upgrade and get onto the Microtik train is the router OS, or more specifically, the Terraform support that it provides. As I've progressed both through my home lab journey as well as my career in DevOps, I've come to love automation more and more. The main issue here is that OpenSense uses an XML file as the configuration backend, and as far as I can tell, they don't really have a fully featured API yet to facilitate making changes to that config. Over the years, I wrote some Ansible roles and playbooks to try to implement my own configuration as code. However, all of these attempts were suboptimal and I was always left wanting something more robust. What I was essentially doing is that using the Ansible XML package, I'd modify certain keys in the config document that OpenSense uses. 
I'd have to be extra careful not to accidentally modify something wrong and bork the entire install, so that was a concern. Additionally, while some of these changes would be picked up on the fly, most of them wouldn't. Thus, every time I'd run the playbooks and they would make some change, I'd have to reboot the system in order for OpenSense to reload the config. As I was saying, it was not an optimal solution, but it worked most of the time, so it was a good enough option for a while. My next failed attempt at network automation was when I got my first Cisco switch. I currently have two, I have the SG350 and the SG300, and they both support a limited version of Cisco's iOS. While there is an Ansible module available for the Cisco SMB switches, it doesn't really work as well as I had hoped. All the module does is that it allows me to send bare CLI commands onto the devices. And that's about it. There is no idempotency at all. Any kind of idempotency I'd have to implement myself in the CLI commands. There are no specialized modules for common tasks like you'd get with the official Cisco modules. And as you might have guessed, these switches are not compatible with the official Cisco modules. To use those, I'd have to shell out for a catalyst or something like that, and those are generally pretty loud and power hungry, since the only affordable models are the older ones that are on the second hand market. So that was not an option for me. Thus, I had to look elsewhere. Eventually, I came across the Terraform provider for Microtik. Unfortunately, it only supports RouterOS and not SwitchOS. For my router, that's not really an issue, since, as the name suggests, all Microtik routers are running RouterOS. This might, however, be a problem for my switches. You see, Microtik has two lines of switches. They have the CRS, which is the Cloud Router Switch, and they have the CSS, which is the Cloud Smart Switch. The main difference between the two lines is that the CRS device can boot into either SwitchOS or RouterOS, while a CSS device can only boot into SwitchOS. The main drawback here is that CRS switches are more expensive. I think that Microtik with Terraform is as close as you can realistically get to something like the centralized management you get with Ubiquity while still using infrastructure as code. Thus, this is me testing the waters. Since Terraform integrates nicely into my GitOps setup, I decided it was time to pull the trigger and give this option a shot. If I manage to automate the device to the extent that I hope to, you can definitely expect a part 2 of this video where I upgrade my switches and my access points as well to Microtik. In this video, we won't really be going into the code and configuration and setting up Terraform. This is more of an unboxing, overview, rant and initial impressions kind of video. That being said, let's get this bad boy mounted into the rack and wire it up. Hey guys, Future Me here. So, it's actually been about a month or so since I recorded the rest of this video and this part, and that's because I had some exposure issues with the original footage and then I forgot to shoot it again. Now, in the meantime, I actually added some more gear into my rack, and I ended up moving all of the networking stuff to the back of the rack to make some more room in the front. You can see we have here the small Cisco switch, which is acting like a dump management switch for now, and then underneath it we have the big one, which is just in storage, I didn't have anywhere else to put it. Now, I had to take the Microtik out to take the images for the thumbnail of this video, and now I get to mount it back in, so I thought this would be the perfect time to just shoot this part again. This has been in my rack for a while, so all of the cables are already routed, it's just a matter of putting it in place and then screwing it in. So let's do that. I have to say, one nice thing about the K79 is that since it allows you to mount multiple units in a single one year of space, you get a bit of space above the device which is actually super handy to run cables through. So you can see I can route my power cable through here and just tuck it away nicely. By default, the 2.5 gig port, so the first one, is configured as the WAN, so I'll just plug my uplink into that one. All of the other Ethernet ports, so 2 to 8, as well as the SFP Plus port, are bridged together in the LAN network. The plan for today, or rather for one month ago, was to use the 10 port Cisco switch that I already had as a dump switch for my management network. This is where I have all the admin interfaces for things like Proxmox, TrueNAS, Microtik and so on. All of the onboard NICs from my other servers are already plugged into this one, so all it's missing is the uplink to my firewall. We'll configure this later to be a part of a different network, and besides that I'll need to plug in a few devices to my LAN network as well. Again, since I'm not using the big Cisco switch anymore, I'll use the ports on the router as a temporary solution before I get another switch. So, here we have my desktop in the last port. 
we have my home assistant box in the next one we have my access point and finally we have my NAS since as I mentioned already my NAS has a NIC in each network that needs storage so I'm not routing any storage traffic with all that done let's get back to the desktop and take a look at the default configuration Now, getting back to my desktop, we can manage our router either via the web UI, via SSH or via Winbox. Now, I'm not familiar enough with the Microtik CLI to go for SSH just yet, so I'll just use Winbox. It's a program that you can download from the Microtik site to help you manage your device. We can now connect to our Microtik router by opening up Winbox and then waiting for our device to automatically discover our router. We can connect to our router using the default username of admin and then an empty password. And if we connect now, we will be greeted with a message informing us what the default configuration actually is. You can see that we have the WAN port enabled and protected by a firewall, and we have a DHCP client on it. So that means that our firewall will get an IP address from our uplink using DHCP. Next, we can see that all of the other Ethernet interfaces except the WAN port are part of the LAN bridge. As far as our LAN network is concerned, we have the IP address of 192.168.88.1 for our router. We have a DHCP server enabled and we'll take a look in a moment to see what the configuration is for that. And finally we have DNS enabled. For our WAN, we have the gateway set to be Ether1, so that would be the 2.5 gig Ethernet port we saw earlier. We have IPv4 and IPv6 firewall enabled. We have NAT enabled and then we also have a DHCP client on it, as we mentioned earlier. Finally, we can see that the admin user is protected by a password, which is actually blank for now, so we will be prompted to switch it in a moment. We can now change our admin password to something more secure than admin and blank. Let's take a look at the configuration for our DHCP server. We can go into IP and then DHCP server and we can see here we have the default DHCP server that's bound to the bridge interface, so that would be our LAN network. You can see it's serving out IP addresses from an IP address pool called default DHCP. To see what the IP address pool is, we have to go into IP and then pool, and we can see here we have the default DHCP pool that's serving out addresses from 192.168.88.10 all the way to 254. If we now open up a terminal and run ipconfig, we can see what our IP address is, and we see that it's actually 255. That is because by default, Microtik will parse the IP address pool backwards, so it's starting from the back of the list and it's going to the front of the list. Finally, for the default configuration, we go into IP and then Firewall, and we can see here we have a list of default firewall rules to keep our device safe. If you want to take a look at all of the configuration that's present in the default config, we can open up a new terminal, log in with our new credentials, and then run the export command. This will print out all of the configuration that is for now present on the device. As you can see, the device is rather plug and play. The default configuration is rather minimal, but it's just enough to get us up and going and get us access to the internet. And that's a wrap for this one. We unboxed my new router, we mounted it into the rack, we got the default config going, and we even went over the reasons for the upgrade. If you're interested in a getting started guide for automating your Microtik device with Terraform, make sure to get subscribed as that video is already in the making. If you liked this video and found it helpful, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button. It really helps me figure out what kind of content you like and what I should focus on. On your way down there, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when I post new videos. Thank you so much for watching and as always, I'll see you in the next one. Cheers guys!